Welcome back to Family Twist. Today's episode is really personal for Corey and me. You've heard us speak to various family members on the podcast, and today we have a very special guest, our niece, Samantha, who's 15. And it's a conversation between Corey and Samantha when he was recently in St. Louis for Christmas. Well, it was actually after Christmas, his family often gets together after Christmas to celebrate Christmas just because it's hard on Christmas with all the in-laws and everything to to get together. So Corey went back after Christmas and spent um, a few days in St. Louis. And Samantha has been wanting to be on the podcast for quite a while. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, welcome back to Family Twist. It's Corey here. I am in St. Louis visiting family, so Kendall is not with me. He's back on the East Coast with the Critters, but I am sitting with our niece, Samantha. Sam, you've been asking about being on the podcast for a little while, right? Well, when your uncle has a podcast, I obviously want to be on it. (laughs) Well, I mean, we know you don't have any family twists like the ones that we typically talk about on the show, so like no DNA surprises yet. Mm -hmm. No, not yet. (laughs) We'll see. And no adoption stories or anything like that yet. But you are part of the story, the bigger story of, you know, Kendall and Corey moving across the country. So nine years before we decided to move to New England to reunite with Kendall's birth family and his dad's side, we had made the decision to move to the West Coast, to the San Francisco Bay Area. And when we made that decision, my sister Rachel was pregnant with Sam. And so I decided that I couldn't leave until after Sam was born. So I remember the, I know you don't remember it, but I do remember (laughs) the day you were born. Yeah. (laughs) And you know, you had a little bit of a cone head when you came out. Yeah, I know. I've heard about it my whole life. (laughs) Well, good. Well, you you can't even see it anymore. Yeah. (laughs) Unless I go bald. Maybe I'll join you soon. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So my big thing, my big worry about moving halfway across the country is that that you wouldn't really well not that you wouldn't know who I am but we wouldn't have the kind of close relationship that I wanted us to have and so that was really important to me right for you know so you for you to know who I am and not be like when I came to town like who's this scary stranger man yeah yeah I know (laughs) what you mean yeah I was definitely happy my mom's told me lots of times about you guys staying for me to be born and I feel like It's always been like a great, I don't really know how to put this into words, but it's always been great to have family outside because all of my family's in Missouri. So traveling outside to like California and now Boston, but traveling to California was definitely like very fun because I could get to say that I have family outside of Missouri. Right. Yes. And visiting you guys was always fun. And I was always happy that we still had that close connection even in different states. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you and um, your mom started visiting us in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. I think the first time you were two. Yeah. And that was a crazy whirlwind experience because you guys, you know, flew in to the Bay Area and then we immediately drove to Southern California to go to Disneyland. Yeah. And you probably don't remember any of that, but you've seen photos and stuff. Yeah, right? I've seen all photos, got stories. Yeah, I've definitely... I remember all of that. I haven't been to Disneyland since you guys lived out there. I'm wondering if, like, the experience of taking you on some of those rides when you were two years old, like, warped you a little bit and made you not want to get on (laughs) rides at, like, Six Flags and stuff. Oh, no, I love roller coasters now. Now, Maybe you Maybe you got me started on it. Oh, that could be. Because I love roller coasters, and I was scared of them for a little while, but now I'm all about them. I'll go on any roller coaster. Awesome. Any. Yeah. What about the ones that shoot you straight up and go like go back down in the same direction? I've never seen them. I know about that one roller coaster where like you go on it, like people who are like old in age or have diseases go on it to like because uh-huh. like it's so fast that it kills you. <laughs> have you not heard about that? No, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah, you might not want to ride it, but yeah. No, I'm guessing I'm not gonna ride that one. Yeah, yeah. but I I like them. I did the tilt in Chicago. Is that where you're like? Hanging over the side of yeah. a building. Oh, I, I can't do that. I've also done the dragonfly at Six Flags, which is where they like drop you and you're oh, like, swinging. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I would enjoy that one either. No, I definitely <laughs> like roller coasters, I think. Awesome. Well, we started like this, also this tradition of taking photos at the beach with our tongues out. And... Yeah. 
sleeping photos. Sleeping and wax photos. Museums. Oh yes, the sleeping photos at the wax museum. Yes, yeah. No, that was definitely a lot of fun. So, what are your earliest memories of like? us getting together either here in St. Louis or in California? My earliest, earliest memories were like whenever we went to California and we did go in the wax museums and like there was like Spider-Man and all yes. of that. And we took all the photos. But my earliest memories that like I, like that is just like bits and pieces. But I remember when you guys came in and it was at the Maryland Heights house. Yes. And you guys were in the basement. I came down and I oh, was yeah. like hanging out with you guys and stuff like that. But yeah. that was probably my earliest. And then I remember like you guys in the living room and like stuff like that. I don't know. I, rem- I remember some like bits and pieces, but right. definitely not like, I don't remember any of the like flights to California or anything. Oh, oh I okay. remember the first time I watched Teen Beach movie was at your guys' old place in California. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. It was a great <laughs> movie. <laughs> I tease Sam's mom a lot, my sister, Rachel, but she was really good about taking videos and talking to Sam about us and asking her questions about us when she was two, three, four years old. And, you know, that was just another way to, like, make sure that we were in the picture, even though we were, you know, thousands of miles away. Kudos to Rachel for doing that, because it's, it's fun. And she would post the you know videos on Facebook or yeah. text them to me. Now you have, now there's all these embarrassing videos of you yeah i remember whoa what did i say it was like saying i wanted to marry you or you're my husband or something (laughs) like that yeah of course it's gonna be my husband answer me one question what Corey's excited for what Corey wants to just come lay down and take a nap? Yeah, that's how my husband. Who's your husband? Uncle Corey, my husband. <laughs> Uncle Corey's your husband? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, when did you get married? Um, I got married and I was a strong Uncle Corey and I and I get married with Chloe and Dante and say, Watsy Hadzy. That's really freaky. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then I remember saying something about you sleeping, like snoring or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? You didn't want to sleep in the bed downstairs because you said Kendall pooped in the bed. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> That, that was, was my earliest memory. Ooh. I came down in the basement and he was laying on the bed and I just thought, <laughs> is he pooping? I don't know why that came to thought, but... <laughs> Hopefully he wasn't. Hopefully not. Because uh, I slept on the bed after that. Hopefully not. So, yeah, I, I definitely made it a point, even in those uh, early days, that either Sam would come out with my sister or Sam would come out with my sister and my mom at least once a year. And then I came home at least once a year. And usually stayed at least one or two nights at with your family. Mm, right. You know, um, there was a Christmas Eve that I stayed over. You know, we went to the party at your aunt Mo's. And do you remember the uh, Virgin Mary outfit that I got you for Christmas? No. <laughs> oh yeah, there's pictures. <laughs> Is it um, in that one video of me like singing about Jesus or something? I was wearing um, like a robe. Yes, it? that. Yeah, the yes. white robe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember getting that. Oh, one of my earliest memories is I remember always getting Muppet. Yes. Even if you weren't in town and we called you for Christmas, I'd always get them. I'd always get huge boxes of all the Muppets characters. Because that was one thing that was very, like, our thing. Yeah. Yes. Do you still like the Muppets? Yeah, I still have all of the stuffed animals. Oh, awesome. They were in storage. I don't know where. I guess they're in the basement now. Yeah, I still have all of them. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, like, when you think about our relationship, what would you? How would you describe our relationship and your relationship with Kendall? Um, I think I'm definitely closer with you than I am with Uncle Kendall, but I say I say I'm pretty close with you guys. I mean, obviously, like, 
you can't be super close because of like just the being so far away from each other has obviously like been a lot but I think if you guys move back I think it would be great <laughs> and whenever you're in town it's like nothing's changed like it's not like awkward or anything like that right yes and we we text so yeah we do text I think we do have a good relationship but yeah. um especially with you and Uncle Joey and Uncle Kendall only being my only aunts slash uncles on my mom's side and then for my dad's i mean most of them have passed only right. one aunt is left All right, so yeah. definitely just always being closer with my mom's side of my family too has always been like a big thing and she's so close with you guys so i've always been very close yeah we keep a family text going well there's one that's just me and rachel and yeah. joe and then there's one that mom is on too but i mean they're both on none pretty- with me and them <laughs> not yet. Well, they're they're pretty uns. Yeah. Let's put it that way. They get pretty <laughs> they're raw. Not appropriate. So you you kind of brought something up that reminds me of like some friendships I have with people like my college roommate Matt or some friends that I went to high school with that have moved away or like you know my good friend Rachel Beck who's we're going to see tomorrow. We're celebrating yeah. uh, Christmas after Side Christmas. Yeah. Which is like you know you're you're close with somebody you know them so well that like a year could go by. And you're hanging out, and it's not weird at all. It's like you're yeah. caught up. You're caught up within like a couple of minutes, which is that's, that's good that we have that kind of relationship. Yeah, because I know um, a lot of people have talked about this, like where, like you can like not see somebody for like months on end, or for us even a year sometimes, yeah. um, or more. Yeah. If like the circumstances aren't met, like during COVID, it probably didn't see you for like two years or right. three or something yeah. very long time i think that even like being far away from someone you can still keep those ties you'll never be as close as if you're living with someone or next door neighbors but yeah you still have like if there's enough like love and connection to reach out even being so far away mm-hmm. then there is love there you know like i think that's how what a relationship makes it like long distance relationships like you still need to like, just being there to reach out is enough to know that they care. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll experience that with friends someday, especially if you're, like, if you do end up going to college um, on the, one of the coasts, you know, yeah, you're, yeah. you're going to have friends that stay in Missouri. Yeah. Just like, you know, we have friends that have, you know, stayed in Missouri. So you just, you know, you figure out how to navigate those relationships. Mm-hmm. And if they're meant to be, you know, then you'll still have the the closeness whenever you see each other, you know, which is pretty cool. So one of the things I noticed last year, so last year you and me and Rachel went to New York right around Christmas time. And that that was a cool to have like a, a vacation together. And I was just impressed that like, you just were reading like an actual physical book. It was <laughs> Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. I'm assuming you finished it by now, right? Yeah, I have. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, wow. It's a great. Here's a 14-year-old reading <laughs> Sylvia Plath. And yeah. not for school because, you know, we were, you were on holiday break. You were reading yeah. it for pleasure, which I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And that you've become interested in social justice. I think that's really important. Hopefully, maybe me and Kendall have rubbed off you a little, you know, a little that way, because I know, you know, your mom's not super interested in politics. Yeah, not very. And, and your dad's politics don't necessarily align with Kendall and my politics. Yeah, like <laughs> opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> yes. So I, I thought that was really cool. I'm just kind of curious to get your opinion about something. We talked a little bit earlier when we weren't recording about some of the episodes of the podcast have been themed about donor conception. People mm-hmm. who find out that they were donor conceived either early on their parents told them or sometimes it's really traumatic because they don't find out until they're adults and then it rocks their world like, oh my goodness, my dad is not really my birth father and yeah, I've got yeah. all these half siblings out there. Some of the people that we've been talking to are getting into advocacy and what they're really fighting for is donor anonymity because there's a lot of gray area and not a lot of regulation with that. There are people that They'll come in, you know, they'll, they'll donate, and they might not give their full medical history. They might lie about their medical history. Yeah. And then there are kids being born who the only thing that they're given is a donor number, yeah. and they don't have a full medical history. Yeah. And, you know, they get sick, and all they've got is, like, half or none. They feel like they're being cheated and lied to. This community is actually just starting to rally together to mm-hmm. start for change. Like, there was a protest in New Orleans oh. late last year. Okay. just on that same subject. So I'm just kind of curious 
now that I've told you a little bit about it, what do you think about donor rights? There needs to be like some regulation. If you're born from donor and say say your parents, they don't want to tell you like they don't want this to come in between their relationship. If your parents told you if you could get your own history, I think that that's something you really should know so that people are safe and know where they come from. Because that's how a lot of these things are coming into the light now, are these home DNA tests. And people are finding out, they're getting online and finding out, like, I've got half-siblings, I don't know this person's name, and I don't have any half-siblings, and what's going on? I would want to know everything. Like, even health risks, I would want to know about that. It just really sets you on a rocker. I could never imagine being well into my life and started my career and all this stuff and then finding a whole nother part of my life that's been unlocked. Like, it's yeah. just, whoa, it's really scary. Yeah. Now, Kendall's fortunate in that he always knew he was adopted, and so yeah. his, his adoptive parents were always very open with him as to his situation, and in Arkansas it was closed adoption, so he really had no outlet for trying to find his birth family right. until these consumer home DNA tests came along, which is why mm-hmm. he had to wait. 47 years to find to find this whole big family right but you're right yeah it's scary then once you get to know you know your family it's it's a beautiful experience because he's got a good relationship Mm -hmm. with his family on both sides now and i think your your instinct is right in that it would rock your world absolutely it's just so like life-changing so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because I've never asked you about this before. And I know you're 15, so of course you've got years to make decisions and change your mind. Have you thought about, like, do you, have you thought about wanting to have a family of your own someday? Like children? <laughs> yeah, I have thought a lot about it. As I'm getting older, I'm thinking differently. Obviously, ask me this in 10 years and it's going to change. Yeah. But everybody says that this isn't, like, this isn't how I'm going to think when I'm older. But I've never wanted to have my own children. I think pregnancy is a really beautiful thing, and for a woman to be able to do that is like amazing to create life. As much as it is an amazing thing, I think I'd want to adopt. I definitely do want a family. Yeah. I want children. I'm very big on like getting a career. I haven't thought much into like having a family of my own. Sure, I get it. Yeah. But um, having kids biologically, I don't know. As of right now, probably not. Yeah, we'll love to hear that because he's you know he's a huge advocate for <laughs> yeah. you know adoption, fostering and adoption. I definitely want to adopt because one, I just think that it's like a very good route. Like uh, obviously having your own kids is like, if you want to do it, like, that's amazing. Like adoption is like an amazing way to like one, help the world. Like there are like kids who want just a home. Yeah. And I think that adopting is a beautiful thing. I definitely want to adopt. And I've been like that, like my whole life. Like <laughs> I know I'm a child. Fortunately, like, we're not living in the time when, you know, young women your oh, age yeah. were like, you know, living we're on the farm and starting now. to have kids. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness I can't cook. And I'm not fond of cleaning. So <laughs> whoever I marry hopefully will be a good cook. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely very passionate about working and I want to make my own money and be successful. I think it's awesome that you're already thinking about the next stage and what mm-hmm. you kind of want to do. Some people don't start thinking about that until later in high school. You're a mm-hmm. freshman mm-hmm. and you're already starting to think about like, what's next for me? Mm-hmm. And it's so funny to hear um, you talk about, you know, like, I got to be home by eight o'clock because I got to get in bed by such and such and I got to go study because of, like a couple mm-hmm. years ago. <laughs> Not- yeah, a couple of years ago, I would do anything to get out of homework and stay up late. <laughs> like, this weird thing about me is, mom, my mom thinks this weird, but I, like, every single night, I'll write down, I have one of my notes app right now, like, yesterday, I have to write down everything that I do, and then I have a certain time for how long that'll take. So, for showering, I give myself an hour, and then picking out my outfits, 30 minutes, skincare is 30 minutes, so I calculate how long that'll all be, and then I set that from whatever I want to go to sleep at. So, if I want to go to sleep at, like, 9 or 10, um, and say everything's going to take me three hours, I'll start everything at 10. I'm very big on that. This year, at least, I've been very big on doing my homework immediately because I just, I really want to get good grades. Like, I want to succeed. I've always known that I've been, like, on the smarter scale. I went through the gifted program like you did. Yeah. And I definitely want to be an academic weapon. And I want to do good. So <laughs> When did that switch change for you? What was the aha moment that... Well, for me, I've always been smarter, so I've always wanted to succeed in school. Yeah, you've always gotten good grades, and we've always known that you're very, very smart, but like you weren't always as studious. Yeah, it's this year. I thought, okay, I'm starting my high school career. I know colleges are going to look into these records, and I want to get into a good college. 
so I really need to lock in this year. Last year, I didn't as much. I know eighth grade does matter, but at the same time, I was like, I'm in eighth grade. Who's gonna be looking all the way back? And if you do, that was me a while ago. I definitely have just switched from last year, like never doing my homework and all of that and like taking whatever classes they gave to me. This year, like picking all accelerated classes and getting ahead in all my classes. For my classes right now, I'm days ahead so that I can just have more of a relaxed time. And definitely this year, I'm going way harder than I ever have because I want to see how much I can handle. Yeah. That's really impressive. You're talking about organizational skills at 15 and planning. You, you think about the concept of nature versus nurture at all? Is that something that you've learned about in school? Mm. The things that you naturally get from your genetics traits right. and things like that Learning. versus the things that you are exposed to and taught? Mm -hmm. Like, on the nature side, I think it's fair to say that your parents were not the best students. <laughs> yeah, no, dad dropped out of <laughs> high school, mom dropped out of college. Yeah. So. so, like, where do you think that drive comes from? I really, really don't know. I know both my mom and my dad are hard workers. They're True. They're both very hard workers, True. even if they didn't have book smarts. There's different things about each parent. My dad has always been very, very good at math, where my mom is very good at, like, technical skills. And I think a lot of it does come from nurture. Seeing my siblings, like my sister, she excelled in school. She was very smart. And then seeing my brother kind of challenged more. This is going to sound bad, but I kind of distinctive myself as like, I want to be the smart child. All of my siblings are hilarious. So I kind of wanted to have my book smarts, okay. you know, to yeah. show up. I've always got along with people very well, like getting along with my teachers and them wanting me to excel in school made me want to excel in school. So academic validation is a huge thing for me because yeah. I don't get a lot of validation from boys that much. So. There's plenty of time for that. <laughs> and you don't need validation from the boys <laughs> or the I, girls or wherever you end up. Yeah, but definitely self-validation for life. There you go. Yeah. I just wanted academic validation. It was just one of the things that kind of boosted my ego the most. It's a confidence builder for you. There's like a generation gap between you and your siblings, two generation gaps. Yeah. I wonder if that generation gap kind of inspired this quest for academics. Oh, that's actually a really good point. I've never thought about that. Yeah, my twin siblings are seven years older than me, and then my oldest brother is 20 plus older than me. Looking down the line, I want my family to be close, and I and no hate my mom because I love her to death and she's my favorite person ever but my mom has definitely like went through a very hard time so I had to mature very fast when she was going through the hardest time I was also trying to be like her source of happiness that's a lot of pressure on a kid yeah but I mean she was the best not that like, she was putting the pressure on you but no the pressure she, that yeah. you might have been feeling because yeah. you wanted to make her happy because she was going through so much pain yeah right exactly so I think uh, seeing that taught me a lot and just me and my mom like having such a close relationship because of being our, on our own. We had a lot of sources around us that were love and like, a lot of people who cared for us but like just separating from my siblings and my father for like even a little bit of time was definitely like something that bonded us together sure. a lot more. So I think just seeing the connection I have with my mom has taught me healthy relationships with your children right so i want to be close with my kids but i'm also a parent to them you know right but i do want to be a very good source for them to go to so they always feel safe how i feel safe to go to my mom i think that's important for me and also i just really want to love my person and my mom has taught me that if you have the confidence to not be happy in a relationship then you should be able to voice that even if she didn't voice it the best way or if it was messy or whatever <laughs> she voiced how she felt and I think that's really important going to therapy before they separated I think that's important and honestly it's just taught me how I want to see my family I see family as a very positive thing I know that family is important and it doesn't make me not want to find love like yeah. love is like one of my biggest like it's love and success for me I really want those things in my life when I'm older that's very important to me and family too and so I think that hasn't changed anything for the negative way. I mean, it probably has, and that's for my therapist to find out. But for now, I am i don't think it has. I think that's where the nature and nurture thing, there's definitely some gray area there. You mentioned that the relationship that you've got with your mom and feeling like you could go to her, you know, with anything and she's going to be open to, which is the same way that I feel about my mom, your grandma. Your grandma didn't have that with her parents. Yeah. So it's almost like it started with grandma continued on through Rachel, now it's going to continue through Sam, and then Sam's kids. 
Yeah, Grandma's told me about her parents, and I think that she went through a really hard thing, and for her to be such an amazing, like, she's my, like, I mean, obviously my parents come first, but she is one of my favorite people on this entire planet. Like, yeah. I would do anything for her, and she's sacrificed so much for me, and done so much for me that I want to be like her in every way when I'm older. The way she can annoy me. She can <laughs> send me over the rails sometimes, but... <laughs> But she's definitely, like, a very big... Um... I've been living with her for 48 years. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. But the way she is with her children and her kindness and grace, oh my gosh, and her patience. She's got so much patience. I mean, putting up with me for years and living with her. Right. Um, yeah, it definitely passed down from her to her kids. And I think her parents shaped that in a way that my parents will, too. Right. Like, it's the same thing. Right. You look at the challenges or the mistakes that people before you made, and you don't want to make those same mistakes again. Exactly. So you, yeah, you want to be better. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, if you don't grow up with the best home life, you want to be perfect for your kids. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I think she was. Yeah. That's really cool because I hadn't really talked to you about your your perspective on family as a whole and, mm -hmm. and future and stuff like that. So I really appreciate you being open to talking about it. There are young adults your age that probably wouldn't be so open to talking about it, you know, on a podcast that goes out to the, to the, to the entire planet. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I'm so funny, my dad. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he listens. Yeah. We'll see if I get a text. Right. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sam. I, I, I appreciate you taking this time to to just answer all my questions and, you know, not telling me to bugger off and <laughs> So. No, I wouldn't. I was so excited to come on. I've been asking since you first got it. I know, I know. But I feel, you know, feel like that this is the perfect opportunity to do it. Another bonding moment for us, another moment mm -hmm. to, for us to be closer. Another thing for you to remember down the years when I retire and you take care of me and Kendall when we're older. Yeah, I'll buy you <laughs> that mansion. I'll buy you right, that mansion. Awesome. That's what I love to hear. <laughs> I'll always entertain you. You know, with jokes and whatever. <laughs> and and I love to cook, you know, so then uh, there you go. That works out perfect. You're giving me food and wisdom. I'll give you a house. Uh, yeah, it's, perfect. It's wisdom and food for a house. I'll take it. Wow. That was a really good conversation between Corey and Samantha. And I just want to make a few comments um, about it because I was not there and didn't get to listen to it real time while preparing for this episode i got to hear it for the first time myself and i really learned more about samantha than i knew before and i think it's so cool that she is open to the concept of adopting a child herself those of you who know me know that i'm i can be pretty critical about population explosions if we can just take existing children who have been abandoned or, you know, need a home and a loving family can help them. That's, that's great. So I really obviously relate to Samantha's comments and I appreciate them so much. I didn't know that she was, and I don't think Corey knew either that she is open to adoption. And I have known for quite some time that Samantha values education a lot and Corey and I of course do I'm one of those people who when I was a child there was no discussion about whether I would go to college it was just an assumption it was spoken about from the time I can remember being a very small child and I love that my parents were very open with me and let me make a lot of decisions for myself and for what I, you know, pursued when I was in like, you know, elementary, junior high, high school, that sort of thing. But that discussion about college was there was no other option. Of course, I could have chosen not to go. And, and at the point that I did go, both my adoptive parents were dead. So it's not as if, you know, they would ever know that I really went. But like I said, it was just a foregone conclusion that that was going to happen. So I'm really happy to hear Samantha, you know, embrace that idea too. I wanted to point out, I love that Corey and she talked about roller coasters because I don't like them. In fact, I had never been on a roller coaster. Well, except Kitty versions until I met Corey. 
and he got me to ride a couple at Six Flags and I hated the experience. I thought I would and I did and I don't ever want to do that again. I don't like that motion. I don't, you know, I'm such a paranoid person sometimes that I worry that I'm going to be one of those rare people who gets injured, you know, or killed on a roller coaster. So I hate them. So I'm really happy that, you know, Corey and Samantha could probably do some of that together and leave me to stare at them from, from the ground. And then just want to make kind of the official disclaimer. I think you understand that I did not poop the bed that Samantha was talking about. I, it sounds like I was asleep when she was in the room, but I don't remember ever knowing that she thought that I did that, but she would have been really quite young. Probably she was three or four, but anyway, uh, so I just want to say I did not uh, poop on that bed that she referenced. Anyway, thanks for joining us, and I hope you really enjoyed that conversation between Corey and Samantha.